My name's Colin Baker and this is my M5 T5i E28. I've bought this 16 years ago. Uh, the intention of totally renovating it all and then changed my mind and decided to totally go full style modification on the vehicle. Bought it from Mansfields. Uh, my brother helped me pick it up on the trailer. Uh, brought it back here after a two and a half hour drive. Got it into the garage and on that day I started stripping it and 16 years later it's turned out what it is today. The main reasons I've gone to my old style BMWs is I've had modern BMWs before, uh, M3 CSL, I've had uh, E90s, E30s, E36, I've had numerous BMWs. I've always preferred the older style BMWs because of the character, the engines are easy to work on. The first things first when I got the car is when I stripped it all down, it was originally in silver. I already picked the colour before I even picked the car. So it's called an Amasis BMW colour. It's off a motorbike and it's a 1980 colour. Uh, and I'm pleased that I picked that colour because I've had so many comments about how good the colour is and what is the colour, where did I get it from. And obviously I enjoyed painting it because my actual profession is body shop painter and panel beater. So when I was painting it, you know, I knew that this would be the right colour for the vehicle. And it's my own mix as well, so with extra ultraviolet in it. It's had extensive modifications on the vehicle. Uh, it's had the manual transmission put in it. It was automatic. It's had two engine rebuilds. One original engine rebuild when I first rebuilt it, and then when I turboed it, I had to obviously decompression with all the engines, so forged pistons, forged com rods, uh, MSL gaskets, ARP bolts, etc. The MS2 ECU, it's, it's running. It's running about 500 brake horsepower bar of boosts. Uh, I don't really use the power as often as I should. A lot of people tell me that I still drive like an old woman. <laughs> uh, but my intentions are obviously to start using it a bit more and using a bit more power on the car because it, it's not doing it any good just obviously driving back and forth to the shops in it. It's been a long, long project, like I say, 16 years on and off. Uh, I didn't really intend to get to this stage as it is now. Uh, it's been to obviously car shows at Santa Pods. I just kept going there back and forth for a period of four or five years. People kept saying to me, you need to go to more car shows. What am I going to do to it next? You need to turbo it, you need to supercharge it. So, and then I just turned around and thought I need to basically rebuild all the engine again, turbo it. So it went from turbocharging the engine, charge cooler system instead of intercooler. Uh, like I said, decompression all the engine again. And just to turbo build the engine again, it took me two and a half years to do it properly and to make sure obviously all the gearbox is going to withstand the torque, all the prop shafts. So it's running obviously airlift performance management system, but obviously all the front and rear shocks all have to be custom made because they don't do an off the shelf kit for the E28. So that was obviously a task to get all that to fit correctly. All the interior is Alcantara that I had to stitch by hand. Uh, I tried to stitch it with a sewing machine, but with the old piping, it wouldn't work. So I had to put a load of masking tape on my thumb and sit on the dining room carpet over a period of months, stitching it all by hand. 
uh, all the reef lining, obviously, Alcantara as well. Uh, the roll cage is wrapped in Alcantara. Where all the boot build is Alcantara. It's only recently, in 2021, that I put the stereo build in, uh, that I'm still in the progress of finishing. But obviously I'm pleased that I've got it in there now, so most of the hard work's done. Uh, but the main task in hands for next year, 2022, for the shows, is to add another turbo. So it's an inline turbo. So I'll be running twin turbos, gold plate those as well, 24 karat gold plating. The rest of the car is obviously 24 karat gold plating, rocker cover, headlamp bezels, rear lights, badges. It's got obviously the old style pocket watches, obviously on the oil cap and charge cooler reservoir, a petrol flap. With this car, I knew I couldn't sort of do the fresh clean look there's too many knickknacks in the car already so I went for detail wanted to sort of see if I could get as much detail in the engine bay interior boots anywhere I could get some detail it pays off because I can see obviously all the people pointing out all the details and then when it goes to the next show someone else has just noticed another detail of the vehicle so it's always pleasing to see it shows obviously the public seeing all the different details that keep occurring on the car. Getting to the gold is when I first did the turbo engine builds, uh, it was just normal chrome turbo. I went to a show with it, happy enough won a trophy with uh, obviously the chrome turbo and the new builds, that was the ultimate stance. The Sunday I got back from ultimate stance, I thought I need to do something extra to this car. You know, I'm still not happy with it. I still need to do something. And a friend of mine, Rob Mitchell, who does gold plating and all artwork, I contacted him, uh, asked him if he could do me, obviously, 24 karat gold plating on the turbo, because he does a lot of 24 karat gold plating on Harley Davidson's, his own engine, and obviously a lot of other customers. He managed to do me the 24 karat gold plating on the turbo, and obviously into cooler piping. Uh, obviously, it came at a cost because with that you have to obviously send in the way the castings, the turbo, all the castings have to be burned, has to be polished, then nickel plated, then so many microns are 24 karat gold plating on. So, and then once I've got the turbo done, it's basically like a drug. Then I wanted more gold. So it was rocker cover, I wanted gold plating. Strut brace, I wanted gold plating. Little bezels around the gauges, I wanted gold plating. Rear lights, I wanted gold plating. Front grille, gold plating. So it's like a drug. The more gold you get, the more you want. Like I said, my intentions are adding the second turbo means more gold plating. Uh, but it won't stop there. Wheels that I'm getting custom made by Trina Wheels, I'm going to have most of the spokes on those gold plated. If I can afford it, the roll cage will be 24 karat gold plated. That's how it came from just a single chrome turbo to, at the moment, the car's running about five and a half, six thousand pounds worth of gold on at the moment. I don't really want to add up how much it probably will be when I actually finally get the second turbo done and the world cage and all that. Uh, same car I'll probably have to keep quiet for my missus. <laughs> when I first got the vehicle, there was a lot of micro blistering all under the paintwork because the car's a 1985 E28 M5 V5i. Uh, it was all original, all original paintwork, all original pinstriping. It never been touched, but it was just micro blistering all over on the rear spoiler, all down the obviously doors. Uh, there was hardly any rust on the vehicle. There was only a little bit of rust on the near side jacking point. It didn't seem like a major task, but when obviously I started flatting, Obviously, all the micro blistering down, I knew that really it's got to be bare metal. It's got to come back to all bare metal. So it's a bare metal all the outsides, all the wings off, doors off, boots off, gutted all the interior. Uh, then, obviously, I welded up the jacking point on the near sides. My intentions are with the doors, with the mouldings, there's a recess in the doors. So I wanted to make them flush 
So to obviously weld up the recesses on the doors and obviously refill the doors. So to do that on all four. Uh, the seals, the MTEC seals, are moulded into the rest of the wings. On the front wings, there's no join between the bottom of the wing and the seal. It's all in one. And the actual wheel arches, the MTEC wheel arches, are moulded in as well. So a normal person just looking at the wings would think it's just a normal wing. But you've got obviously the steel wing as well as the plastic ABS wheel arch on it. So, and they obviously had to blend all that in. The mirrors are off an E12. Uh, when I bought those, so I knew they wouldn't fit the vehicle. And people would probably say, why are you buying something that's not gonna fit the vehicle? Well, that's the whole purpose, uh, modifying cars. And so I knew that, they, you know, they look a lot better. They're not as like bulky and clumsy. So that, that was just a little bit of obviously manufacturing different plates so it obviously fit on the back. Uh, they're not electric, they're all just like manual mirrors you move by hand. So there's no electric mirrors on there anymore. But it's just a case of just manufacturing different plate just for it to fit on the doors. The Wheels OZ 3P split rims. Uh, when I first bought those, they were running a three and a half inch lip all the way around. They were white centres originally, stainless steel lips. But I thought, no, I need to have deeper wheels on the car. I'm putting it on air lifts. I want it to have a really deep wheel, deep stance. So I decided, obviously, to strip the wheels down, paint the centres a satin black, obviously gold-plated bolts for the split rims. And then I went for a four and a half inch lip on the rear and a three and a half inch lip on the front. The fronts are running 10.5J and the rears are running 11.5J. With that amount of obviously wheel under the arch and on air lifts, I've had to do obviously extensive inner arch work to the rear and to the front as well. And the other difficulty I had when I did that air lift suspension on the fronts, the inner actual bands of their alloy was catching on the actual strut itself. So I had to actually file down very minimal the actual outer side of the actual band itself so it was missing the actual shock itself so when it went down i wouldn't be scraping on the wheel as well as shock the steering wheel is off a m3 e30 evolution uh, i bought that from bmw at uh, quite high costs when i bought it off my bmw dealer they told me again that's not going to fit your vehicle colin you know, it won't fit on the actual steering column itself. But obviously, me being me, I wanted it to fit. I wanted the actual Alcantara steering wheel. I just didn't want like a copy one or any ordinary one. I wanted a proper BMW one. So I thought, yes, it would go on perfectly OK. No, it didn't. It went on the splines fine. But like the actual steering column cowling, top plastic part and the cast part underneath was stopping it bolt fully down, seated. So I had to take all the steering column off, cut all the cowling down, all the casting down, remove obviously the indicator stalks and the light stalks for the steering wheel to fully fit and obviously remake the actual casting and the plastic cowling again so it would fit flush with the steering wheel. When I was doing the interior, my plan was I wanted to do something different with the dash the actual door trims. Uh, I was unsure whether to cover them in Alcantara, like the seats and the roof lining, or just change the colour from you know, another E28. But again, I thought, oh, I just need to do something different with it again. So I thought, oh, I'm going to decide to paint them. Um, because obviously they're a porous material, and it's difficult to paint porous materials because obviously cracking, they expand and contracts. A lot of people said to me, well, I wouldn't paint it, you know, you're going to have problems with that. You know, it's going to flake off, it's going to crack, it isn't going to work. But again, I thought, well, no, I'm going to have a go. You know, I'm not going to be beaten, I want it to be different. So it was a case of, obviously, trial and error. So I did a couple of trims, uh, obviously keyed them up, rubbed them down, uh, plaster primed them, uh, lester primed them and then made sure that was fine, and then primed it up, I painted it, 
It was fine at first, but over a period of time, obviously after all the paint cures, it all sinks down into all the recesses of the actual material. So it's a case of we flat all the lacquer down again, we base it, and then obviously lacquer it, polish it up again. And again, I did this about four occasions. So the dash and the trims on the doors have had probably eight coats of lacquer on over a period of time. And the dash has actually stood up to time and the door trims because they've been on the car in the heat, cold, with the heater going. Uh, and I've had no issues with paint flaking at all. Uh, obviously I've had stuff put on the dash and no issues with it marking because it's like I said a porous material. The roll cage came out of a E12. That came from Northern Ireland and that came out of a stunt vehicle E12. Uh, that was a job to get that. I hunted high and low to just try and find a roll cage for an E28. And again, people said, well, just get one built. I managed to find an E12 and they said, well, why are you putting an E12 roll cage in an E28 when you can just build a roll cage for an E28. But me being me, I just thought, oh no, I need to buy this roll cage, I want it, I'm getting it. Finally got it, and again, obviously it isn't going to fit the vehicle. So I had to cut about the roll cage for it to fit. And I didn't want a weld-in roll cage, because I wanted it, if I didn't like it, I can just take it out again. Or if I want to change bits of the roll cage, I can just take it out again. Like I say, It'd be coming out again because it's a gold plate it. So it's a bolt-in mold cage. It's not there really for any purpose. It's there just for show, like the gold is. So that's why it's bolt-in. It has got nitrous on the vehicle. Uh, before I did the turbo conversion, I was running nitrous. The 70 brake horsepower jet on the vehicle. Uh, I used it a couple of times. It's got nitrous controller in it. Uh, it never seemed to harm the engine, but I was always scared of it doing something to the engine, so it was only for split seconds I used it. Again, then when I decided to rebuild the engine for the turbo, I thought I'm still going to keep the nitrous on the car, so I'm still going to keep it plumbed in. The car's been computer mapped on a runway. Uh, when we computer mapped it on the runway, with my friends, uh, we had a couple of issues. One being that the actual wastegate got jammed. So when we went under boosts, it hit 333 kPa, which then obviously the engine and management system didn't like. So you can imagine how I was feeling then. I've just rebuilt an engine, spent thousands on an engine. First time I put it on the runway to map it, and there's an issue, and then the engine started misfiring all the way back to the workshop. We found out that obviously the wastegate got jams, and the actual fuel regulator, the diaphragm in it, blew back the wrong way. So obviously it wasn't getting any fuel fuel. So we redid all that again, down the runway again, finally got it working, and at about a bar of boost, it was running about 500 brake horsepower. Down the runway, the, basically the highest I've had it out was probably about 120, 130. Uh, the guy that kept obviously mapping it for me, kept saying for me to put my foot down, but obviously I never did. You know, like I say, people keep saying I drive like an old woman, uh, and I don't think I've ever had my foot fully down on that floor, ever, on the vehicle, when I probably know that the engine can probably take it with the amount of money that's been put into it. But again, I know the power's there, you know, I know what it can do, and what it, I can put my foot down if I want to, but when you spend that amount of money on the car and that amount of time, I don't want to destroy it myself. <laughs> and then obviously have all the time of rebuilding it again, thinking for that split second, if I just thought, no, I'm not going to do it, I wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> Biggest difficulties with the builds, uh, some seems quite simple and some hard. The biggest difficulty for me, which seems strange, would be putting the charge cooler system in. Because there's any, hardly any room for the charge cooler system. Because you're running the actual intercooler itself, the charge cooler, the pump and all the pipes. Uh, and with obviously all the front panel, 
I didn't want to cut all the way the front panel because obviously I'm going to have to make a new frame up. And so it's trying to fit all the charge corner system in with all the existing work uh, and then trying to get that to bleed. And then obviously because the pump has to be at the lowest point and the reservoir has to be at the highest point and trying to get the actual charge coil system to flow properly and bleed properly was an absolute nightmare. Moving pipes about or the pipes at a too tight of angle so it wouldn't flow properly. Uh, but I finally managed to sort it with a lot of obviously late nights in the garage but it took me probably two, three weeks to get that to work properly. Uh, the other difficulty was getting the actual airlift system done. Like I said, it's running airlift performance management, but because they don't do off the shelf kit on the airlifts for the E28s, it's actually you have to cut the struts off the actual hubs, re weld the shafts, then obviously put all the actual, actual bags on the shafts. Uh, to get all that to fit correctly and the actual right camber and everything well, I had to obviously make sure it was perfect at first one of the cambers was out so when I actually had it on the car you know, I had to camber plates on even though the camber plates were in the right points the offside wheel wasn't actually on camber correctly so I had to take all that leg off again recuss it, re-weld it, get the camber sitting right same with the rears, because I'm running 11.5J on the rear and 10 on the front, I had to cut all the inner wheel arch out, so when it does drop down, obviously it misses all the inner wheel arch and it can drop all the way down. Uh, the other task I had in hand was with the turbo, trying to run a 3 inch downpipe down the side obviously of the engine on the offside, because you have the steering column and the steering knuckle and the rack. So it was basically running three inch, trying to squeeze it down to two and a half inch and back out to three inch again. And because I'm running no box or cast or anything, it's basically a straight through pipe. Obviously then I'm running a three inch all the way along the bottom of the car and out the side of the sill. So obviously then I have to detanium wrap that because that's right up against the actual floor pan. So I don't get too much heat and as well make sure when I do drop it down on the ground, it's not dropped down onto the exhaust. So the joy of this car, uh, you do have to get to know it. You do have to get to know the car. If just a normal random person just got in the car to drive it, they probably would get out straight away again. Because you do have to get to know the car. It's, it's in traffic, it's okay, but it overheats a little bit. So you have to obviously have the fan on because obviously it's a top mounted turbo. So in traffic, is you do have to keep moving slightly. It will, you know, it never overheat completely, but if you're stuck in traffic for an hour, then I'll turn it off. Doesn't like to be driven slowly, even though I say I drive slowly, because it wants to be driven hard. But I know how to drive the vehicle. So to me, it's, I've built this vehicle to suit me. So in a way, it's funny, I'm the only one really knows how to drive it. It's this, driving this car is no different to me driving my daily car. But someone else would think, lovely car, great car, really looks good, really looks nice, sounds nice, goes well. Can I have a drive in it? Uh, they would never ever drive it as a daily. Uh, had one issue with this vehicle which is funny in one way, but at the time it, it wasn't at the time. Uh, it was going to Ultimate Stance 2021. Uh, normally I drive this vehicle everywhere. People always say to me at shows, do you drive it? And I said, yeah, it's driven to shows, even in the rain, it's been to Manchester back in the rain. It's been to 100% tuning, Holland in the rain and back. This time I thought, oh, it's the last show of the year. Uh, I'm going to put it on a low loader. I had a chance of borrowing a low loader off my company. Unfortunately, that was busy, so the other lad at work, he let me borrow his low loader. Uh, he told me all what to do, how to load it. Loaded the car on, uh, and unfortunately, uh, the front of the car fell off the ramps 
and it was basically balancing the front seals were balancing on the actual ramps and the bumper was actually holding the vehicle up on the low loader. Uh, at that time I thought well that's me done I'm not going to ultimate stance the car's ruins that's it I've had enough it's going away for the winter now to do my work on it uh, phone my friend to say how am I going to get this back off the ramps or how am I going to get back on the low loader it's stuck so he came down so we had two trolley jacks jacking up the ramps to lift it up off the actual low loader beds uh, then we let the tyres down on the low loader we let the bed go down reverse that back connected the winch because that was another issue I had when the winch was connected to the car the winch slipped so every issue that could have gone wrong trying to load my car onto the car went wrong uh, the guy and myself managed to get it back on the transporter uh, at that time I thought well I'm still not going to go uh, but obviously at that time it was 12.30 had to be at ultimate stance for two luckily enough London Cartel said no that's fine if you can get here we hold a spot open for you you know the place isn't closed yet so left at half 12 got to ultimate stance just before three and then I thought oh, now I've now got to get the car off I hope this doesn't happen again so I managed to get the car off perfectly fine and the car went back on perfectly fine as well going home but I was ever so pleased that I went because you know the car got a lot of obviously respect again a lot of interests uh, it was a great show was just seeing new friends and old friends again uh, so I was really pleased that I just didn't think no that's enough's enough and I was ever so lucky that only caused a little bit of damage to the front bumper it could have been a lot worse longest drive is to Holland's uh, my first it was my first European show 100% tuning uh, so obviously I was nervous driving to Harwich in the dark in the rain going onto the ferry we obviously left late and we had to make sure we were at Harwich by 10 o'clock so we were driving obviously within speed but for me 65 mile an hour 70 mile an hour is fast for me so I was like in the rain 65 mile an hour 70 tops and I was like well oh, I don't know where I'm going in the rain I don't drive fast I'm going all the way to Harwich on the ferry and then obviously off the ferry obviously a different country I've never driven abroad and I'm pleased I went as well because that's a massive show you know the amount of cars and the builds there are mental you know really good you know the quality and even better obviously I came back with the top 10 trophy pleased with the finished article I think obviously like I say there's a lot more I can still do with the car and a lot of people say to me you, know, you must have finished it now 16 years the car must be finished but uh, like most people with show cars the car's never finished you're still obviously adding to it or wanting to change it or you've built the show car it's been going for four or five years and then you just need to think I'm going to totally redo the car again with this build of car there's not a chance I can totally gut it all and restart again. I've got to keep adding to it and adding to it because after 16 years worth of work, obviously it's a part of me now. It's obviously, it's me, that's what I put into it. Uh, to try and build another full show car build again, I don't think I'll be alive to do another 16 years of building. I'm getting too old now for it. So this car is going to be with me as much as I can you know and then obviously it will be in the family and passed down to the kids the same as my father's done with his car and so on I'm happy with how it's come out uh, I'm happy with what I'm going to be doing to it and the more pleasing thing is when it goes to shows it's a plus when you win trophies at shows it really is but it's even better when you get a lot of respect from people even the show car builders themselves, you know, say, you know, hats off to you, you've done a great job, you know, it must be hard work, you know, and they always get the questions, how much have you spent on it, how much does it cost? It's difficult to put a price on a thing like this really, you know, it's, I've spent thousands and thousands and thousands on it, 
you know, with the gold plating, with the paint, with the turbo, with the engine rebuild, with the wheels, everything, you know, it's difficult to put a price on it. To my mind, it's, it's priceless to me, so it's my sort of like build. I'll never sell it, so it's not really matter how much it's worth because it's never going to be sold in my lifetime anyway. So I just keep adding and adding to it, pouring money into it. And then luckily enough, the company that I work for now, they're obviously willing to help me build the car even better than you know, it can be done now. So with my sort of vision in mind and the company, obviously tools, can help me build this car to the best I can possibly get it. And that's my intentions are before I actually get too old to finish the show car scene, is to make this car the best I can ever build it. I think at the end of the day, I'll be happy with that.